This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 805, recorded on September 14th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Here it's 85 Fahrenheit, 29 Celsius, partly cloudy, and it's supposed to rain in a little while. So when does it start to get cool there? Next month? Uh, no, it's it's actually gotten cool. We're, we're back in kind of an Indian summer. Yeah. At night, it must be cool, right? Yeah. Because we, we're at 26 here, but at night it gets very chilly. Yeah. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. Uh, we've got uh, 84 degrees and sunny. It's nice. Uh, and yes, it's getting, it's slowly but surely seems like it's cooling off here. And from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi. It sounds like we all have relatively similar weather. Uh, 81 here, as Vincent pointed out, 27C. Um, but it seems pretty nice and much nicer than last night when we had huge storms. Yeah, we did have storms last night, didn't we? Mm -hmm. I was worried they were going to flood again, but they didn't. They were shorter this time. That was good. Hey, Kathy, any uh, PSAs? Education. Oh, I haven't checked the status on town halls. We pro we must still have. I know there's still. Uh, I'm I'm up for one in okay. like a week from Friday, and I yeah. know that there are several in between. So yeah, they are still ongoing. The uh, ASV education town halls. Right. ASV.org/education. Okay. Now today for your edutainment, we have first a viewpoint published in Lancet, and this is called Considerations in Boosting COVID-19 Vaccine Immune Responses. And a lot of uh, authors from different places, I think it's important to point out uh, where they're from. So the first author is Philip Krauss from the FDA, who we mentioned last week, and also on the paper is Marion Gruber. So they're both from the FDA and both apparently resigning over this issue. Um, and then we have people from University of Washington, University of Oxford. Hey, University of Florida, Gainesville. Look at there that. University of West Indies, uh, University of Bristol, Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico, uh, the uh, Wits Reproductive Health and HIV Institute in Johannesburg, University of Paris, University of Oxford, we already said that, uh, the InClen Trust International in New Delhi, and WHO. So people from all over the place who I suppose are sharing um, the opinions stated. So this is a viewpoint. So it's not a data paper. It's the, there. Well, I guess there's some data in it, but they didn't do experiments. right? <laughs> and um, this is their viewpoint. And as the title says, it's all about... Um, boosting vaccine immune responses. And they start out, I want to go over this because I think many of the points are very useful. Any decision to um, enhance immunity, they call it by boosting, should be evidence-based and consider the benefits and risks for individuals and for society. And they point out, and they do this several times, that the vaccines that we do have continue to be effective against severe disease, including that caused by the Delta variant. And they make a distinction, which is really important that I, I really hadn't thought of, although I think it's obvious. You know, when the vaccines are tested, they're tested using placebo-controlled, randomized clinical trials, right? But then once the vaccines are out there and you want to know uh, the um, how well they are working in the real world, then you do observational studies, Right, where you don't have a control group anymore. Or we, you may have unvaccinated people, but you're not enrolling them specifically. And they say, so if you want to know how vaccines are doing against Delta, for example, you do an observational study. And they say most of the studies on which this, these conclusions are based that the vaccines prevent severe disease are preliminary and difficult to interpret precisely due to potential confounding and selective reporting. Right. So, 
confounding. There may be other variables that you don't know about that you're not controlling for because you didn't enroll the people and look at everything that you wanted to look at, you know, besides the usual things like sex and location and age and so forth. There may be other things that you don't know about. Um, and selective reporting. Maybe you're not reporting all the data. And they say that um, decisions about boosting need to be informed by reliable science, more by politics. <laughs> How about that? They actually came out and said it. That's really good. And then they say, even if boosting were eventually shown to decrease the medium-term risk of serious disease, uh, they say the vaccine supplies could save more lives if used in unvaccinated populations. It's an interesting point because I have read other articles where they say, it wouldn't make any difference. You know, if we decided not to boost that vaccine, wouldn't make any difference. And here they say it would. So next, is it, no, this Friday, we will have two people who, who recently published a science paper modeling what the effect would be to give vaccine to under vaccinated populations. So that'll be interesting to hear their perspective. Um, so they do say that in some cases, boosters, the right thing to do. Um, like if the vaccine you got was low efficacy, which some of them are lower than others, uh, immunocompromised people, um, although they say, you know, if, if you didn't respond, there's no guarantee that you're going to respond if you give a booster anyway. Um, uh, and in addition, they say a good question is, should we give you the same vaccine or a different vaccine? Because there's some evidence that mixing can, uh, can sometimes help. Uh, then they say that boosting may be needed in the general population because of waning immunity to the primary vaccination or because of variants. And I wish they defined waning immunity, right? Because um, this is my viewpoint, and I'm not an immunologist, but we have all we have mentioned this on and off. You know, if you waning serum antibodies is what happens, right? What we don't want to happen is waning memory B cells, right, or so forth. And I don't think there's any evidence that that is waning, right? Right. Officially, they should have said that whether there's waning of the immune correlate of protection below the threshold needed for protection, but that's kind of a long <laughs> sentence. <laughs> Perhaps. And we don't necessarily know exactly what the right. immune correlate of protection no. is. No. Exactly. So nor nor do we know what the is. threshold is. Yeah, exactly. Right. All right, so then they say uh, there could be some risks if we give boosters widely too soon. Maybe immune-mediated side effects like myocarditis or Guillain-Barre syndrome. And they say if there are side effects, you know, significant adverse reactions associated with the boost, uh, that would have implications for vaccine acceptance, right? So that's a great point, I think, that if you give people boosts and suddenly have an issue, then you're going to discourage people even further. So they said, because of that, you should make sure you have clear evidence that boosting uh, is appropriate. Okay, now um, they, they go on and talk more about randomized trials and observational studies. Uh, and then they, they, um, they talk about the literature. Some of this literature involves peer-reviewed publications. Some does not. And it is likely that some details are importantly wrong and that there has been unduly selective emphasis on particular results. Um, so they're saying, be careful of uh, preprints. And, well, and, and I think there's also something to say about that selective emphasis on particular results. Yeah. Um, and, and in some ways, this is a problem in all vaccine literature. Um, if you have people with breakthrough infection who have symptoms, you're going to notice that that happened. And you're going to say, oh, my gosh, look at this thing that happened. But if you have a whole bunch of people who were exposed and didn't know they were exposed and didn't get sick and live happily ever after, um, you're not going to report on all those happily ever afters because hmm. um, you don't know that they are really happening um, in the same way. Uh, and so there is a fair amount of selectivity in what gets reported here. All right. Then they actually make a figure, uh, which kind of, which summarizes a lot of this information. It summarizes the reports um, for estimated vaccine efficacy, efficacy separately for severe disease, which they note 
there's no there's no one definition for severe disease variously defined or for any confirmed infection they plot one against the other i really like this um, because this is a topic we've talked about many times before and it's come up in the context of you know the uh mm, i don't want to call it misinformation because it's not necessarily deliberate misinformation but misunderstanding uh, I think in many cases of of what what the data actually mean and and distinguishing between infection on the one hand and serious disease on the other hand. So these, as Vincent said, these graphs have vaccine efficacy against any infection on the x axis. So that could be anything that's at least PCR positive, mm -hmm. okay, even if it's asymptomatic, or it could be you're dead. All all documented infections. And on the y-axis is efficacy against severe disease, which we've already said there's a squishy definition, but they've done their best, I guess, to unsquish that, okay? And if there were a one-to-one -one correlation between the two, if vaccines were equally effective against infection on the one hand and severe disease on the other hand, then there would be a, a, a you know, one-to-one -one correlation. They draw a straight line that represents that one-to-one -one correlation where 10% efficacy against infection would equal 10% efficacy against severe disease. So the way this is presented, anything that falls above that line, okay, is uh, something where the vaccine efficacy against severe disease exceeds the vaccine efficacy against infection. Mm -hmm. And so it makes it really easy to visualize this. And I really appreciate that. It's pretty, and let's as show we've it discussed, briefly, yeah. As we've discussed many times before, the efficacy against severe disease of all these vaccines under many different circumstances is much, because among other things that, well, it is much greater yeah. than the efficacy against um, any infection. You can see maybe waning immunity against, um, against, uh, let's see, early, later. Yeah, you can see if a part yeah. D there in the lower right. Uh, later means later after vaccination, right? Yeah. Uh, that corresponds to a lowered vaccine efficacy against infection. But the, the vaccine efficacy against uh, serious disease has is essentially unchanged all the variants except for gamma i don't know about gamma but beta delta alpha pretty much equivalent in terms of severe disease um uh, it's really really a nice demonstration evan they also break it down by vaccine type interesting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. mrna protein subunit they're both uh, high up there in the 90s, right? And then the vectors are a vectors bit still older. approaching 90 in terms 90, of yeah. effectiveness, against, uh, effectiveness against severe disease, even though it looks to be only 75% against infection. So, you mm -hmm. you know, uh, people look at this, oh, it's only 75% effective. Well, no, nonsense. If you look at the, uh, the real epidemiological data and look at... Um, of effectiveness against severe disease, it's, it's more effective. And, uh, you know, essentially, I guess, the fact that all these points are above that line, that there's really quite good efficacy against severe disease argues against the necessity for a booster. It's also really nice that they showed those uh, data with confidence intervals. And mm -hmm. they tell you how many studies were used um, yep. in putting together each of those points. Um, and, and so really being able to get an idea of how much data do we have? How reliable is this number um, is, is very useful. Uh, I like this graph a lot. The question that always comes up, I've heard many times, is if today we still had ancestral SARS-CoV-2 circulating, right? No variants what would this look like? Would there be decreased efficacy against any symptomatic or would we see nothing? I mean, certainly antibody levels would still be declining, right? Because that's what would happen. Um, 
I just wonder if the virus were different, would that make a difference? And I'm, I don't think we're going to be able to address that, right? Because that time is over. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, if, if you look at the same uh, figure, you can see that Delta and Alpha seemed to have similar uh, sort of issues in terms of protection from severe disease or similar ability to give severe disease following infection, um, but different. And so in that case, you would say, no, it would probably look pretty similar in terms of cases of severe infection. Um, but there are some big differences. If anything, it looks, you know, that, that looks yeah. like maybe we're getting a little more spread because Delta isn't uh, able to, uh, is able to infect better. Yeah, Del um, Delta is about, really uh, so Delta is about 85% against anything, right? And mm -hmm. Alpha is 90 something. Yeah. Yeah, that could be it. All right, so um, uh, they, the, these figures, they say that the, the uh, a consistent finding is that vaccine efficacy is substantially greater against severe disease than against any infection, as we have just described to you, uh, and that vaccination is substantially protective against severe disease from all the main viral variants and still high efficacy against both symptomatic and severe disease due to Delta. So they say current evidence does not therefore appear to show a need for boosting in the general population, right, where we have this high efficacy against severe disease. And they say, and I think this is important, even if humoral immunity appears to wane, reductions in neutralizing antibody type do not necessarily predict reductions in vaccine efficacy over time. And reductions in vaccine efficacy against mild disease do not necessarily predict reductions in the typically higher efficacy against serious disease. And they say this could be that because um, protection against severe disease could be mod moderated by, mediated by maybe cell-mediated immunity, which is something we've, we've brought up before. Okay. Um, as they talk a bit more about, um, observational studies, which I think is useful because we often talk about as observational studies. Uh, they say randomized trials are easy, are relatively easy to interpret reliably, but there are substantial challenges in estimating vaccine efficacy from observational studies, uh, undertaken in the context of vaccine rollout, which we're still doing in many places, right? Estimates may be confounded by patient characteristics uh, at the start, which could change time varying factors that are missed by health records. For example, people who are supposedly unvaccinated would actually may have been vaccinated as a consequence of, no, they may have been vaccinated. Uh, they may be protected from a previous infection or they, their vaccination may have been deferred because they had COVID. And they say the likelihood that there are systematic differences between vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals increases as more people get vaccinated, patterns of social interaction change, right? Um, and reduced efficacy among immunized at the beginning could be an apparent thing because in the beginning you wanna get the high risk people Right, so that could change the way you look at the numbers, and these include immunocompromised people as well. So it's a the observational studies are complicated by not only the fact that you don't, you know, have a an identified group of people and you're doing a controlled study. Mm -hmm. The fact that the the population that you're trying to study is changing all the time. Yep. Yeah, I thought that this paragraph was awesome, and I wanted to think about ways it could be used in sort of teaching experimental design as yeah. look at some examples of ways your experimental design can really impact what's going on in such studies. It's almost, I, I'm reminded of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, right? Mm -hmm. Just by making the observations, you change the data. The probability that individuals with asymptomatic or mild infection will seek testing might be influenced by whether they are vaccinated, right? You can imagine if someone's vaccinated and they feel sniffly, they say, oh, I have a cold and don't get tested. So that could. Well, or people who are unvaccinated may be subject to testing requirements that. That's true. 
un, that the vaccinated people are not subject to. So they say to date, none of these studies have provided credible evidence of substantially declining protection against severe disease. Uh, even when there's a decline in overall efficacy, right? Any kind of COVID, which we we clearly see. And I think that this it's been said by uh, public health officials that yeah, it's right, but we're we think in a couple of months it might <laughs> efficacy against severe disease might decline. Therefore, we're being preemptive. They taught they cite a couple of studies um, out of one study out of Minnesota, which I think. Daniel described on one of his updates, uh, point estimates on the efficacy of mRNA vaccines against hospitalization appeared lower in July than in the previous six months, but these estimates had wide confidence intervals and could have been affected by some of these issues. Reported effectiveness against severe disease in Israel was lower among people vaccinated either in January or April than those vaccinated in February or March, which obviously doesn't make any sense, right? And they say this shows the difficulty in interpreting this, these kind of data. Um, and then another report on the experience in Israel during the first three weeks of August this year, uh, this was just after booster doses were uh, deployed widely, suggested efficacy of a third dose. But they say the mean follow-up was only seven person days. And maybe it's just a short-term effect. Maybe it's not going to last, right? So you have to be very careful about saying that this is a good thing to do, the boost, based on that. Um, so they mentioned that in the U.S., there are a lot of people both fully vaccinated and unvaccinated, and they're being compared at the moment. So looking forward to that. Um, recent reports uh, from the U.S., uh, CDC and two HMOs demonstrate the continued high efficacy of full vaccination against severe disease or hospitalization. Uh, and then they, they end up, uh, well, not ended yet. Sorry, we're not there yet. In, even in populations with fairly high vaccination rates, the unvaccinated are still the major drivers of transmission and at risk for serious disease. I know a lot of people are always saying, oh, we have 80% immunized still people getting infected and sick. 20% of whatever your population can be a lot of people, right? Especially if you have 100 million people or 150 million people. So they And in many locations, yeah. it's, there's many more than 20% that are naive. Well, yeah, uh, yeah and that's 20% of eligible individuals. Eligible, True. yes. Yeah. There's more, right. Yep. So they argue that now we should be studying boosters before... Uh, we deploy them. And before there's a need for them, their argument is we don't need them yet. Let's do the right studies. And they say, this is what we do with influenza, right? We check every year whether we need a new vaccine based on the strains that are circulating or the variants that are circulating. And try. And of course, there's a long history with influenza virus, but they do that every year. Um, and then they talk a little bit about messaging. We need to message properly because if we don't, let's say that we do boosting and we, it's not based on solid science, this could affect confidence in vaccines uh, overall, right? And people say, oh, I, I got two shots and it's still no good. Forget it. <laughs> I can imagine that happening. Um, uh, and You're muted, Kathy. Oh. I was going to say, we had that a little bit with uh, masking. Yeah. You know, when we you know, we had the vaccine and we didn't have to wear masks and then we had to wear masks again. So maybe the vaccine's no good after all. I, you know, that was the way some people were thinking. You also say that it's going to be hard if you're going to just boost certain populations and not others. The messaging is going to be confusing and yeah, you know, people will get, do I need a booster or not? I heard you're supposed to get boosters, right? No, no, no. It's just immunocompromised people. Oh, well, well I had cancer. Am I immunocompromised? You know, stuff like that. It's hard. Um, and finally, they say, um, we need to know what dose. We shouldn't just give the same dose as previously. Maybe we could get away with less or less would be fine. And we should figure that out. And we should also plan to gather, gather data, right? Not just give people a third boost or a second, whatever it is, and then forget about it. We should collect data to uh, tell us how it's going. 
So that's that's the the bottom line they summarize. So we should base a decision for boosting on analysis of controlled clinical epidemiological data, benefit risk calculations. How many cases do you think you would prevent with a boost? We should we should figure that out. Um, and this should, and they say it should be based on peer reviewed and publicly available data and robust international science discussion. Um, so do we know how we got here? I mean, the first I was aware of this was actually a, a message from the administration saying we're going to do boosters, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's where it originated. Okay. And my understanding is that CDC was involved at some point backing this up, but has since retreated from that. Is that correct? And I don't know whether the FDA ever weighed in at all. So, I, you know, uh, at very least, from the perspective of this guy, who I follow the news pretty carefully and the science, uh, I'm uh, the communication has been mm, not good. Yeah, I mean, I feel like there was also some messaging from some of the companies and whether they had internal data or whether they were just hypothesizing, speculating, um, was not clear to me. It could be. Uh, yeah, it could be, in fact, that the media pumped this up as well. And then that gets everybody all sort of stirred up and can sort of distort a story, fire it up. So I know that Tony Fauci has been making the podcast rounds and, you know, saying we needed boosters. We're, we're, we know that we're still preventing severe disease, but we think it won't for for a couple more months. So we should do boosters now. He's been saying that, but I don't know where it originated. It's got to be some committee somewhere. Yep. You know? Yeah. I agree. I don't know. And they end by saying, you know, WHO has called for a moratorium on boosting until more people have immunized. And they say this is important because the currently available evidence does not show the need for widespread use of booster vaccination populations that have received an effective primary vaccination regimen. So that is the I, that is the thoughts of all these people who are authors on this paper. And I emailed Philip Kraus yesterday and, and said we'd love to have you on a on a Twiv to talk about this. Although I said I understand if you can't do it now, but maybe later. <laughs> okay. I thought it was interesting and useful to uh, uh, consider some of those issues there. Uh, I, you know, and uh, the, their little acknowledgement says that this this is a fair uh, representation of the opinions of all of the authors. Mm -hmm. They don't say it's the opinion of the FDA uh, or any of the organizations. They don't disclaim that either. But I mean, this is not... Uh, I, I don't think this should be taken as official F FDA uh, statement or anything like that. These are, but to me, it's significant that the, these are the musings of people who have spent their entire, at least two of them, have spent their entire careers in the FDA. It's good that they let them publish this, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't know what the Absolutely. policy is, but. Yeah, I. I can't remember if it was here or somewhere else that I read that they they all very clearly state that this does not represent the views of hmm. who they work for, but um, it's their own views or something like that. Yeah. Is that here? Uh, yeah, the opinions expressed are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the opinions of their respective organizations. All right, now we have a, a research article from Nature. Now, the, we've been waiting for some data on the variants, and now I think we will start to see it more and more in this one, SARS-CoV-2 B.1.612.2, Delta variant, replication and immune evasion, with a lot of authors. And we have... Contribu these authors contributed equally. Petra Mikchokova, Stephen Kemp, Mahesh Shankar Dar, Partha Rakshit, Anurag Agrawal, and Ravinda Gupta. 
And, and so that's the first three authors and the last three authors. And I'm wondering, because this isn't in the final typesetting, if, if maybe they're going to separate it out and give them two different footnotes. Yeah. You know, yeah. The, the first three authors and the last. And there are more because you have, there are two consortia. There's a consortium and a collaboration. Right. Actually, there's the Indian SARS-CoV-2 Genomics Consortium, the Genotype to Phenotype Japan Consortium, and the and, uh, CIT2D NIHR Bioresource COVID-19 collaboration. So there's a lot more authors that uh, they're all listed at the end. A really a lot of people involved in this. So it's a characterization of uh, the Delta, of which there have been a few uh, iterations um, since the original one. And so perhaps a little bit of the, the history of Delta here. Um, if you remember, uh, India went into lockdown um, in mid-2020, uh, and the, uh, the wave was controlled by that, and then the restrictions were eased, and then they've had a, a lot of cases since March 2021. Over 400,000 people died. I'm sure there are more because this has been written a while ago. Initially, the, the B1117 alpha variant was spreading in India. It was uh, introduced from the UK by travel in late 2020. Um, and um, then a B.1.617 first identified in Maharashtra in late 2020, early 2021, and then spread throughout India and 90 other countries. Then we had sublineages. We had B.1.617.1. I guess you would call it Delta.1. I don't know. Maybe Delta is no, the that, dot two. That's apparently Kappa. Yeah. Kappa oh, right. is one and Delta is 0.2. Uh, this, so the original 1.617 didn't get any appellation? I think it was before Greek letters, oh. I guess. Yes. Many, many thousands of years ago. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Before Greek letters. Okay. So B.1.617.1 was the first sublineage. And then it was followed by B.1.617.2, uh, which have an, a, at least an additional amino acid change in the uh, receptor binding motif, L452R. Uh, and B.1.617.2 delta is since dominated outcompeted the others, uh, including the original 617 and B117. They say, we don't know why it uncompeted it. And they provide some suggestions, perhaps why here. So it's a mix. It's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, experimental work in cells and culture. And then there's some uh, epidemiology, a lot of work in this paper. So first they, um, they look at the, the neutralization of uh, the variant with a variety of antibodies. And first they have sera from 12 people who were infected during uh, the first UK wave mid 2020. And they tested whether those can neutralize infectivity of B1617.2. I guess I could just say Delta, right? Mm -hmm. uh, compared to B117 alpha, right? Delta compared they're to they're actually neutralizing real virus. Real virus. That's right. This is not pseudotype or anything like that. This is yeah. a real virus. I appreciated that. Real SARS CoV 2, which of course would be done in a BSL 3 laboratory. And they, so they compared Delta with Alpha with the ancestral um, Wuhan 1. They say it has D614G. I wonder, did this, do you know, I guess it acquired it at some point. Yeah. So at some yeah. point, that's what they're talking about here. Okay. Um, so alpha is 2.3 fold less sensitive to these sera compared to wild type. Um, delta is 5.7 fold less sensitive to the sera. And the um, beta variant from, well, I guess I shouldn't say where it's from, right? The beta variant was 8.2 fold less sensitive to neutralization. And so those, we've heard those numbers before in other contexts, but I just want to point out, we don't know what they mean, right? We don't know if it's bad. 
because we don't know how much antibody you need, how much neutralizing antibody you need to protect you. So it could be that we don't know matter. necessarily what the role of the neutralizing antibody is mm -hmm. in the different aspects of the infection. In particular, as we just discussed, uh, it may it may factor differently yeah. in whether or not you get infected on the one hand or whether or not you get a severe infection on the other hand. Um, and we can come back to that because um, uh, to me, there, there may be a certain thread of logic through all of this and the previous paper. Yeah, that was my thought exactly. Is It's the same question we had yes. with the previous paper. What is the right. threshold? Right. right. Yes. All right. Unfortunately, this is kind of a pre-proof thingy and the figures are all at the end, which is okay for Kathy because she prints them out, right? <laughs> <laughs> you could open up to PDFs. Yeah, I've I tried. Yeah, that. I get confused. I can't handle that. Um, <laughs> but uh, I end up scrolling up and down furiously. And, and yeah, anyway. So then they take Sierra from people who have been immunized uh, with um, either... Chadox or BNT162B2. What's the name for Chadox now? Uh, yeah. I don't remember. Does it have a real name? name. I, thought it did. I, I know the other. Kathy, how do you pronounce the, the Comernity. Comernity. Uh, yeah, I, I think Chadox does, but I don't remember yeah. what it is. Let's look it up. Name for Chadox. Uh, well, it was AstraZeneca, right? Yeah, we've been yeah. calling it by the manufacturer. Oh, here it yeah. is. You ready? No. Vax, Vax Zevria. Vax Zevria? V A X Z E V R I A. Yeah. Vax Zevria. Right. I've got absolutely no way <laughs> to remember that Vax at all. Same yeah. with Comer Comernity, Kathy. Is that what mm -hmm. it is? Makes, yeah, it sounds like community, right? Yeah. Community. Okay. Uh, and, and the other ones vax everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm spike vax, I can do. I like that. Uh, in, in time, you will get used to all of them. Yes. Just the same as we belly ached about the Greek letters to start with. Yeah, and now, now we're, we use them. We're just I'm okay. whipping yeah. them off the tongue. No problem. Right. Yeah. Or Our, it'll become like the influenza vaccines where there's all different manufacturers and all different yeah. names for them, as Vincent found a couple of weeks ago. And. We just ignore it. We just call it the influenza, influenza vaccine. Yeah. The only one I routinely use is flu mist, right? Because right. It's, the, it's the unique one, which is infectious. All right. So Chadox and BNT162, Sierra from people immunized with two doses of each of those. So again, they compare Delta with the ancestral uh, virus, about eightfold reduction for uh, both sets of vaccines here, so Chadox and BNT162. So Delta, eightfold reduction in uh, neutralization ability. And they say uh, a little bit of reduction against alpha, but not significant. And then they did all this again with, this is done with infectious virus, uh, infectious SARS-CoV-2, and they repeated it with pseudotyped viruses so they could test more samples, right? I guess it's just easier to do a lot. As, as Theodora has said, it's much easier to do, use pseudotypes and you can use uh, colored viruses to that are read by machines instead of counting plaques or whatever it is that they do. And they tested a more 16 vaccine elicited sera, and they also tested 617.1 as well as .2. And basically they get the same results as we have just told you. So reduced neutralization against uh, Delta variant. I was a little surprised that there are so few sera involved. You know, in the first test, there was like a dozen. And mm -hmm. in the second, there was like 10. But I'd rather see 100. Yeah, I would too. And the, the, um, the authors will tell you, Rich, you can go do the assayers. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> it's a lot of work, I think, yeah. But it can be done. I mean, I'm not sure if it would find a different... Identifying a sera uh, reliably is probably not easy. No. Okay. I mean, they're relying on... I mean, they they want sera that they can be confident uh, were sera that um, were elaborated in response to the ancestral strain. Okay? Yeah. So that's... Yeah. 
that's they they have to get Sira that came from before the other strains were around. Yep. Okay. Right, and and if you look at it, this paper was received in June. Mm -hmm. Um, and so if you think about, you know, how many people were vaccinated that they could actually get serum from, and we're talking about figure one. So Mm -hmm. they, that was done a while before June. Um, takes a long time, unfortunately, right? It's too bad, but it's a lot of data to review and you, they go back and forth. Yeah. It's just too bad. All right. So then the next thing they did was to take some monoclonals. They collected 33 spike specific monoclonals and they did a neutralization assay. This is a little weird system. They have they have Vero cells, vervet green monkey kidney cells, and they have put in them the gene for Tempris 2. Um and um, what? Sorry. <laughs> then they're using either the Wuhan ancestral D614G or uh, Delta spikes. Um, so, folks, tell me, I forgot what this assay is. What is this here? Does anyone remember? It's in vitro neutralization assay, it's an extended data. Figure one. Let me scroll way down. Okay. Do I have the extended data here? Yes, I do. Is there a picture of the assay? No. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out. I guess this is neutralization, right? Um, with viruses that differ in the spike. Okay. And they uh, ask. So these are, it says neutralization by a panel of uh, monoclonals mm-hmm. against pseudotyped virus. All right. Pseudotype. Thank you. That's what I wanted to see. Okay. okay. Either with the spike from the D614G or yep. the Delta. Got it. Okay. So all three N-terminal domain monoclonals. So remember the spike has different domains. You have an N-terminal domain, you have a receptor binding domain. All three uh, monoclonals against the N-terminal domain and four of the nine non-receptor um, binding motif monoclonals completely lost neutralizing activity against uh, Delta. These are, remember, these are now monoclonals. They're, they're hitting us uh, one epitope each. So which, not- is why, which is why in the therapies we use monoclonal antibody cocktails. Right. Mixtures of monoclonals That's right. to try and get around this sort of thing. Right. And now we know, for example, in the U.S., if you're testing positive, you're most likely have a Delta. So you, you make sure you're using a cocktail that's known to neutralize it. Uh, Within the monoclonals that bind the receptor binding domain, uh, 16 out of 26 had a marked decrease in neutralization, 2.3-fold loss, or a complete loss of neutralizing activity, 16 out of 26. And then they have five clinical stage receptor binding motif monoclonals, Bamlanivimab. See, I've gotten used to now saying I could never say it in the beginning. Now I can. Bamlanivimab. Bamlanivimab. <laughs> I spoke too quickly. Did not neutralize Delta. Imdevimab, which is part of Regeneron's dual antibody cocktail, had reduced neutralizing activity. So I can insert here. I was just at noon at a <laughs> seminar by Jason McClellan, which ah. was elegant and just really wonderful. And he happened to be talking in the last portion about uh, their work on antibody development and how they had um, figured out that bam um, that something about heavy and light chains making connections and salt bridges to uh, the glue residue at 484, which many people may remember uh, is the one that is the E forty four eighty four K or Eek right. variant, right. and so that's why Bamlanivimab doesn't work. Um, and so, yeah, he mm. had the same kind of bottom line conclusion: you got to have cocktails. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Bam Bamlan was originally on its own, so it's right. not used, I guess, anymore, right? <clears throat> But anyway, it's kind of like, uh, you know, HIV, where you make sure that um, 
you, you check to make sure that the virus from the person who's positive is going to be, or you, you check to see what mutations would make it resistant to drugs and you tailor the therapy to that. You don't give the patient a drug that's through which the virus is already resistant, right? Right, right. So I, I didn't really make my point uh, well. What was elegant about it is that Jason was able to show structurally why this antibody was not working against that particular variant. And so mm -hmm. that leads to informed design of further monoclonal yeah. does the Does the uh, monoclonal not bind at all to the variant? Um, I didn't get that level of detail. I'm um, wondering, yeah. Yeah. I, I was frantically writing down notes. You know, of course, I'm the only one in the room that's doing that. And yet you're asking me a question that I still don't have the notes for. <laughs> so he was there? He visited in person? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. It was cool. Yeah. It was for us a named lecture hmm. for, uh, nice. on, on uh, the, the Rowena Matthews lecture. So it was really good. And it was also given by Zoom. So you, if you didn't want to go, yeah, you could see that. Okay, cool. All right. Now a little infect cells in culture, which we've been calling for for months. Let's get some respiratory cells and infect them. So here we go. First, a lung epithelial cell line, KLU3. It's a cancer cell line, right? From lungs, human lungs. And they compared alpha with delta. And, and here we should, we'll look at the figures, but let me tell you the results and then we'll take a look. I, I'm somewhat confused by the figures, but we can all sort them out. Uh, they observe a replication advantage for delta um, in in the replication, and also in if you look at released virions from cells. Next, we tested alpha against two isolates of delta in a human airway epithelial model. So there, you take actually samples from a respiratory tract of a human, you put them in culture and you grow them. And I suppose they do it on a membrane so that they are. Yeah, they have the air liquid interface. Air liquid interface. So they differentiate into proper airway cells, which is not trivial. You know, it takes many, many days to do that. And then if, you know, you get contaminated, then you have to start over again. It can be a real <laughs> nasty thing. Uh, again, they say the delta isolates had a replication advantage over alpha. We're going to look at the graph so you can see the extent of this. And finally, infected primary 3D airway organoids. So you take a stem cell, you differentiate it to a airway organoid. And again, a replication advantage for delta over alpha. And they conclude these data support a higher replication rate and therefore transmissibility which I would say is consistent with, although we don't know, right? But it's certainly, if you saw no difference, then you would say, well, that's not the reason, obviously. Um, and then finally, um, they noticed a higher proportion of spike, intracellular spike in the cleaved state of delta compared to alpha. And so they did Western blots on purified virus particles and they looked with antibodies to spike S2, and they showed in the delta, the spike is mostly cleaved in contrast to uh, alpha. It's quite interesting. All right, let's see if we can sort this out now. This is figure two, which has many panels, and I'm not gonna remember how they did this. Share screen, okay, here we go. Okay, so first, panel A, I think these are the KLUs, right? I, yes. I yes. Scroll down and, yeah, you know, KLU is A through D, I guess, right? So this first one is, so it's always uh, alpha versus delta. And for those of you listening and not looking, I will attempt to uh, explain what we're seeing here. Uh, let me just, I have this other. Thing. Okay. I think SARS-CoV-2 nuclear protein fold difference. I think they're looking for, for nuclear protein by PCR. Is that's that correct. correct. That's my that's my understanding mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. They've infected the uh, what was it? KLU two cells, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and at different times, taken samples and measured 
NP by PCR and, and compared uh, the two infections. Yeah, and so we have, I guess that's a zero time point and then eight, 24, and 48 hours. So at zero, you see the the two are similar, same level. And then at the eight hour time point, the Delta has a, uh, what is it, about a, almost a two log increase. Almost a two almost, log difference. Yeah. And then at uh, 24 hours, it's, it's two log. It's a two log. Yeah. And then it. Two log, by the way, is a hundred fold. hundred fold. Because this is RNA. So I don't know what that means. Right. Uh, and B, they have the Western blot showing a, the Delta has a lot of cleaved spike compared to alpha. It's very interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Well, and in A, it's also interesting that at 48 hours, the, the two are the same. Yeah, so the alpha catches up. All right, that's B. So C is... Um, C confuses me. What is C now? Oh, this it, is... The, uh, C was, they, looks like, it's they say, supernatants mm. were collected yeah. and used to... Uh, scroll down again. Vincent. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Supernames were collected and used to infect Vero cells to measure uh, C viral loads or D TCID 50. Okay, so viral right. loads must be PCR then, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically yeah. what they're doing is they're looking at those first Kalu 3 cells mm -hmm. and looking to see how much virus they produce. Uh, and so yeah, here they said looking, they infected Vero cells and right. used that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Right. So they so basically they took what came off of the Kalu three cells yeah. okay. and yeah. put it on Vero cells to quantitate how much had come off the Kalu three. Yeah. But they didn't really do that because they just did another infection here. Yeah. By, right? Yeah. <laughs> by PCR, I, you know, there's a lot, there's a it's gotta be all the same time or something like that. What makes sense to me is part D. TCID yeah, that's, fifty. That's, that's what I really want to see. That's the big okay? one. Yeah, I that's agree. the that's that's a, like a plaque assay. You're measuring the level right. of infected virus, infectious virus that came out of the first infection, and there you're seeing uh, a uh, a clear difference. Yeah, three logs, right? In the time course, one, two, and three. in the amount, three yeah. log difference between alpha and delta. So that's clear. It's making more virus, infectious virus at both twenty four and forty eight hours. They start off so eight hours. I'd like to see zero here, but we don't. We have eight hours, and uh, Delta is already up a log, it looks like. Okay, that's infectious virus. Uh, that's D. So let's see. E is E is uh, PCR. Uh, what cells is E in? Let's the take human a human airway epithelial cells. Okay, now we're looking oh, at different it. Different culture system. Yeah, two isolates of alpha and delta, different culture system. And here by PCR... So the, the alphas are in orange and the deltas are in green. Um, you know, the delta has an advantage. But F is the plaque forming units per mil. They must have done a the plaque assay on um, Vero cells, I would guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what do we see there? So at um, 24 hours, one of the deltas is doing very well, 10 10 p a few per mil, 48 hours. Uh, in terms of infectious virus, I'd say there's about a log difference between the right. delta and the alphas, right? And then it, uh, is, let's see, goes up a bit by uh, 72 hours. Yeah, at least a log, maybe more. Yeah. Maybe, maybe 20, 50 fold even. And then we have organoids here in G, which is done, measured by PCR. And what was H, et cetera, because there's one plaque assay here. Oh, this is a different kind of assay now. Okay, now we're getting into uh, entry only. Okay, so let's go back to the text. They make lentiviral vectors and... Right. Transfect those and they... Yeah, they're measuring yeah. fusogenic yeah. potential, right? Um they have um, you know, they have split GFP systems, so two different cells with the two parts of GFP, and if they if the two cells fuse, you will get green fluorescence. And basically, they find the delta spikes mediate higher fusion activity than wild type, and um, that is figure two F and G. So let's let's have a look, just to show you, just to uh, be consistent here. 
two H and I, isn't it? Yeah. Or or G or the two parts of H. Yeah. Um, Western blots of virions and cell lysis, right? And J is Kalo three entry. I guess I'm not sure if that's, yes, that's the, the, is that the split that's GFP. The, yes, because it's a. Mm -hmm. Luminescence assay. So we have the wild type, and then the um, the two the delta is about uh, I don't know a log better in terms of yep. entry, right? The first delta slightly less, and then we have uh, in K what's in K growth kinetics, KLU three cells, and this is infectivity here in the second panel again. The two is a little bit better than one. That's, so delta is better than the six one seven dot one, right? Yeah, about a log. Okay. And there are many figures like this, folks. So measured several different ways on several different cell lines. Delta seems to have a growth advantage, and may have a uh, part of that may be fusion. an advantage in entry or fusion. Yeah, and they say the difference amino acid likely responsible is. Um, what is it? I just lost it. That's P681H. Um, no, that's not it. It's P it's P681R. I'm sure everyone is wanting to know that exact change. Yep. <laughs> anyway, exactly. they think that there's a specific amino acid that is mediating that higher fusion. Okay. So... Um, the, then we have uh, the last da data, and there's a lot of... Oh, man, there are a lot of tables and figures with this vaccine effectiveness because they say, okay, we have this data that suggests that um, all these monoclonals don't work. The sera are not as good. So how about vaccine effectiveness? Wait, I'm confused. Didn't yep. you say some other name for Chadox one here? They're calling it Covey shield. Yeah, I did. I, I look, I Googled it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a look what I found. It could have changed since the uh, paper, it could right? Have, yeah. So um, here it is, Vexevria. It's on the European Medicines Agency website. They call it Vexevria. Um, what, what was your name? Covey Shield. Covey Shield. Yeah, that's, that's a nice what name. The, uh, that's what the Serum Institute of in, uh, India calls it, anyway. Yeah, they do. Oxford AstraZeneca formulation. That's what they call it in India. Hmm. Anyway, so you can find bo both. I don't know which, maybe in different countries it has a different name. I think uh, Covey Shield makes more sense than Vax Everybody. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Covey um, Shield is good. Just like language in general, you know, Indian English is different from British English. Yeah. You know, it's different from American English. So, yeah, you can give it different names. All right, so they have uh, some some cohorts here that they looked at. Um, in the UK, this healthcare worker cohorts who started to get vaccinated in early 2021 with Covishield, uh, and then later they were there were 30 confirmed symptomatic infections in these people, and most of them were Delta B1.617.2, and um, they ended up looking at two other cohorts in Delhi with 1,100 and 4,000 healthcare workers and um, had similar data on what they call breakthrough infections with those individuals and they were sequenced and they were, they were Delta. So we know this, I mean, this may have been among the first studies to show this in, back in June, but we now know this from multiple studies. But what, what I think is interesting, and they say across the three centers, there's no evidence that Delta is associated with a higher risk of hospitalization. Really important statement. Yes. Because you will, if you look in the, the news, you will find a contradictory statements to that, right? You can find them all over, more lethal. In fact, remember the few weeks ago, we summarized a couple of, the CDC put out three different reports as supporting um, boosting and there were all three studies that suggested a higher uh, hospitalization for Delta, but I don't know. This is back in June, so. Uh, we just did a paper a couple of episodes ago about, um, that was the, um, 
it was a test negative study. Yeah, yeah. Of a bunch of people in the UK mm -hmm. that showed that, or their data said that the incidence of uh, serious disease uh, was not uh, higher or not significantly higher. Uh, how, how can I put this? The vaccines, both the uh, mRNA and the Chadox vaccine, were uh, almost as effective against uh, Delta as ancestral strains when measured for uh, serious disease. Mm -hmm. and, and I say that, that right? The, yes. Yes. And that's in fact what the previous paper um, Cited, today also right. cited. Yeah. Right. So I, we have a lot of studies that that come to that same conclusion mm -hmm. that when you measure, you know, the ultimate outcome that you really care about, and that is getting really sick, yeah. that the vaccines yeah. are equivalently effective. I mean, you can see a small difference, but nothing to nothing to get upset about. Equivalently effective against Alpha and Delta. That doesn't mean that all of this other stuff is wrong or not true, okay? You're measuring different things. Also, from the previous paper we did, it sticks in my head. They say how an observational study, you have to be really careful of confounding variables. And that's what these mm -hmm. are when they say, yep. you know, the more people went to the hospital with Delta, well, it could be confounding issues there or patient selection and so forth. You have to be really careful. So, anyway... So they summarize increased replication fitness. I love that of Delta, right? And we've been saying that for a long time, increased replication fitness and reduced sensitivity to neutralizing antibodies. Um, and the, the fitness may be, so this is in cells in the absence of antibody. It's more fit even, even without any antibodies present. So they say maybe uh, it has to do with uh, faster entry or release and somehow the, the cleave spike is is playing into that enhanced entry. So maybe that plays part of the enhanced fitness and would give it an advantage over uh, ancestral viruses. So I think this could perhaps explain part of the transmission issue, right? Remember what Jeff Shaman said, it's it's multivariable, multi-factors yep. are more of it, and maybe this is part of it, but. And Ron Fouché focused yes. on uh, immune escape. Right. So, which, which is part what, of it, I guess, right? I think what we've been able to agree on is that uh, these variants, uh, we're using a sort of a, a neutral word, they spread better, okay? Which could right. be, there could be many reasons for that uh, and, and not just one. And it seems to me that you could, maybe the, immu uh, the immunological data in this paper says that, yeah, there's, these have a, an advantage not necessarily that they're immune escape mutants, but they have some advantage uh, confronted with existing immunity and can spread a little better uh, when confronted with immunity to the ancestral virus. Maybe they replicate a little better. I don't know how that, in culture, I don't know how that plays out in people, but it could yeah, be higher virus load, could be, mm -hmm. could be replicates faster, who knows? But it's, it, you can imagine how that might contribute to spread. Uh, and so these, these, you know, hint at mechanisms why these variants may spread through a population faster. Mm -hmm. None of that means that they're going to uh, kill more people or send more people to the hospital. Okay, in particular, confronted with uh, vaccines, they may do they may do it a little faster. Okay, that may make them harder to keep up with. Okay, but the uh, at the same time as all this is going on, we have a lot of uh, different good peer reviewed data that say that the existing vaccines are just as effective against the variants um, uh, in, uh, when measured for serious disease. And we'll see more of this, I'm sure, now, right? We're going to see more studies like this, uh, which use different approaches. We're going to see animal models. So we'll begin to put together a picture, I think. I would really still love to see <laughs> somebody measure infectious virus shedding from people, you know, I know that people have done PCR, but I would love if a study could be designed where you're specifically going after measuring infectivity in a time course 
it's not easy to do, but because you have to. Especially now, because everybody's going to be infected with Delta. What do you compare it to? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and how do you get those people early enough to do that time course? Yeah. Well, there you'd have to put put together a cohort, you know, I don't know, 100 people and just have them swab every day. And you'd have to find them in an area with high, you know, high incidence of infection. No, it's a hard study to do. I, I thought maybe a college campus is a good place for some. Maybe all those people who uh, initially signed up for the uh, infection study in England. Yes. Uh, I don't know what happened to that study. It's ongoing. Yeah, <laughs> I've someone sent an email saying uh, it's ongoing and um, what the goals are. So, what could, what are you suggesting? Taking ten people and infecting them with alpha and ten with delta. <laughs> Uh, I, um, yeah, that's where my mind was going. Yeah. I'm not actually suggesting it. I wonder I what, um, that. so if you had a, an You're antiviral, if, if you, oh, if you had an antiviral that where you could intervene, if someone got sick, right, that would be fine, but we don't really anyway. What, that, what I was going to say is you might be able to do it in some place like South America, where I think Delta is not predominant. Right. I was going to, I was thinking New Zealand, but they're, they're not going to let you get anywhere close with virus. Hmm. All right. There you go. Delta is different, right? Well, I, you know, I like, it gives me a way to think about this. Okay. And I, and I, uh, it's been mm, good for me to think about the difference between, uh, you know, spread on the one hand and the possible mechanisms behind that and consequences, you know, uh, health, what it does to you on the other hand, and that those, those are not the same thing necessarily. Yeah. I, I also look at it and most of the data we've had so far is really observational data. None of this that we had today, infections in cell culture, where you look at the, you know, one step, one step growth cycles that I think, gives us a lot of information that we've been missing. So I'm really happy to see it. But, you know, we don't have much of that for, for alpha e even so far. And I'm not sure people are going to do it, right? Because it's, it's over. Although there is a preprint looking at alpha transmission out of uh, Rocky Mountain Labs in an animal model. But I would like them to do delta, right? <laughs> anyway. Okay. Let's do a couple of emails. Ooh, Rich, can you take that first one? <laughs> he writes, hi, Twizotopes. There are viruses, right? Some in fact bacteria. Do we know of any beneficial viruses in bacteria? Uh, and some of us, eukarya. Why bacteriophage? You're making the world a better place. Thanks, Pete and Sydney. I suppose this is in response to Maya's uh, uh, visit last time, you guys talked about phage. Maybe, you know, but also I, I think the twivotopes is a play on epitope, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, I actually uh, looked this up because I was wondering whether um, the word bacteriophage was coined before people understood or thought that these were actually viruses. And the answer is no. Bacteria, so uh, bacterial viruses were discovered in uh, around 1915. Uh, the two, uh, they're sort of co-discovered by um, F.W. Tort and uh, de Harel. Um, and actually the bit I looked up, I forget where it was, uh, talked about another guy looking at bacteriophage at the same time. At any rate, uh, there are, uh, quotes from de Harel that basically in the same paragraph, if not the same sentence, use bacterial virus and bacteriophage at the same time. Okay. Mm. And why, why he decided to uh, introduce phage, I don't know. I'm glad he did because it's a cool word. So phage is just Greek for to eat or devour. So this thing eats or devours bacteria. And in fact, I suppose... Uh, you know, it's worthwhile understanding that if you're messing with these things in a laboratory, uh, if you spread bacteria out and let them grow up to create what we call a lawn, which is, you know, just 
gazillions of bacteria coating the surface of a petri dish you can see it as a sort of a film uh, on the dish and if you drop a little bit of phage on that it makes a plaque okay because it destroys all the bacteria and it clears away that film and if you didn't know anything else and you looked at it you'd say holy cow something's eating my bacteria okay so you know it's a it's a nice descriptive term it's a it's a virus that eats bacteria, a bacteriophage. Beneficial viruses and bacteria. Beneficial phage. Yep. Uh, well, hmm. You know. Uh, Beneficial to whom? Yeah. <laughs> well, if it's a lysogen, you could move yeah. genes around and you get you could get antibiotic resistance that way. I think. Yeah. Right. Which is uh, beneficial to the bacteria. Yeah. Not to us. Not, not to us. <laughs> uh, okay. So. Uh, they move genes around a lot, right? They move genes around so a lot. So that's good. Actually, uh, he uh, I'm going to cheat here because he mentions uh, eukarya. Mm. Uh, one, of my, uh, one of my favorite examples of viruses that are beneficial is the giant viruses that infect phytoplankton in the ocean and contribute to the carbon cycle mm -hmm. okay by uh you know turning over uh, turning over the algae you know a, a lot of the carbon cycle is controlled by viruses that infect those organisms phage i'd have to think about that one could you kind of think of something like super infection exclusion yeah. um and excluding yeah. a Excluding lysis. Sure. Yeah, that would be fine. Uh, we need to talk to some of these uh, gut people uh, who think about uh, microbiota uh, in guts because, you know, uh, yes. the, the, the microbiome in our guts is not just bacteria. It's, uh, yeah. I'm sure, a complex equilibrium of bacteria and bacteria phage. That's right. That's mm -hmm. absolutely right. So that right. equilibrium yep. is going to be dictated to a very uh, significant extent by the phage that are present. So and that would that impacts be on our health. I don't know. That would be an example of how phage are good for who, whatever organism has them in their guts, right? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Well, Pete didn't specify, so we could take the liberty, right? <laughs> <laughs> Brianne? Paul writes, dear Twiveners, here too, I mean, he gives a link. Cheap antigen tests are widely available from about $3 and 40 cents uh, from Paul in the Netherlands. Um, and I have not looked at this link, but just from what Paul says, I am uh, very uh, jealous. Last week we had someone from Germany linking us to the cheap antigen tests in Germany. Yes, I, I like that it is called the Snell test. And here, of course, they're anything but cheap. So we had a little discussion about why <laughs> that would be. So every uh, every country will now chime in, yeah. There was a stretch of time when um, two communities in our county, Ann Arbor and Ypsilanti, uh, individuals could get a set of 25 test kits from uh, Cudell um, for free. Wow. Yeah. So I have a set of, well, 20 now because I gave a couple away. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, but that ran out. So I don't know if they used... You know, if they used COVID money or, you know, something, but they invested mm. in that. But it's it's really great because, you know, if kids, people want to know before they send their kids to school, if they've been exposed or they have the sniffles or, you know, whatever. That's that's where I think the next chunk of money should be going here, maybe before boosters. Yep. Just better testing, which we've said for more than a year is would be important. Mm-hmm. Kathy. Marco writes, hello from Guatemala, land of eternal spring. This is Marco. I'm a pediatrician and I've learned a lot from you guys. Thanks for everything you do. I know Vincent has said that he thinks fully COVID-19 vaccinated people don't shed viruses. Can you explain why you think this way? I've tried to find an answer, but I haven't been able to do so. Thanks again. Also, I have no idea how to write a haiku. <laughs> is this okay? Beautiful today, an ancient volcano sings at the old jungle. That's a proper haiku, right? Uh, yeah. Beautiful today, yeah. 575, right? Yeah, nice one. From Guatemala. Yeah. So he's probably looking out his window. Mm -hmm. Nice. You, you mean you do know how to write a haiku? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, 
I don't know good evidence, but someone put a link here to a CDC document. Uh, yeah, we were, we were, you know, th this has come up a number of times. And so we had a communication from a listener uh, who sent a uh, MMWR paper titled mm -hmm. Epidemiologically Linked COVID-19 Outbreaks at a Youth Camp and Men's Conference, Illinois, June, July, 2021. And uh, essentially, this has a bunch of, uh, you know, it describes an outbreak, but it also describes uh, spread to contacts. Uh, and it describes spread from vaccinated people who got infected to other individuals. Okay. So there's epidemiological evidence mm. uh, that uh, people who are vaccinated and become infected can infect others. Yeah. And the people who get infected don't get hospitalized. So they're still protected by their vaccine, right? Yeah. But this has implications. So the, yeah. So this, I mean, to me, this is no, no surprise at all. Yeah, we uh, rail and complain about the difference between PCR and infectious virus and that kind of stuff. But I don't think any of us will argue that vaccinated people uh, can't get an infection. No, not at all. Okay? So yeah. you got virus replicating in you. And to me, it would be shocking mm. that uh, at least in some circumstances, you didn't cook up enough virus so that you could infect somebody else. Right. Okay? I think that if anything we may have hypothesized that it may be less frequent yeah. than in yeah. unvaccinated individuals, um, though we don't have um, solid evidence on that. We're just sort of talking about based on the theory of what we know. Um, but I wouldn't say even with the less that it is going from some to zero. You remember right. the single... Go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, less frequent and <laughs> yep. also for a shorter period of time. Yeah, sure. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Going with Singapore. So maybe in this kind of coast camp thing where people are you know, overnight church camp, that's the kind of situation where you would transmit it, even if you're Certainly. shedding less, right? Yeah. But, you know, I, I, I think about it this way too. Where do these variants come from? If in fact, part of the variation is immune escape, what, what, that they're being selected by immunity, what does that mean? To me, that means that there's virus that is escaping an immune response from mm -hmm. somebody, mm -hmm. okay? So it grew on somebody who was already immune, okay? A little bit. Yeah. So I, I'm in my mind, I, got, I need an epidemiologist to argue with me here, but in my mind, uh, a lot of the evolution may have to do with at least a little bit of spread among people who have either been immunized or uh, previously infected and get uh, reinfected and, and a variant manages to squeak through a little bit and get out because when that variant infects it, well, actually, according no, so, to the paperwork. So wouldn't ahead. it be that the selection is happening in those individuals? So yes. maybe the, the mutation is happening before that, uh, a group of genetically diverse viruses are transmitted together and the one that has better fitness um, in the vaccinated person is the one that can evade. Fine. But my point is yeah. that in the vaccinated person, that virus grows and, exactly. and it spreads yeah. to somebody else. Yep. Okay? Exactly. And it doesn't have to be a big deal. It doesn't, it, there doesn't have to be any disease involved or right. anything else. So they say these findings underscore the risk for outbreaks at camps and large events where prevention strategies are not implemented. So I guess they weren't masking. That's part of the issue. But I mean, <coughs> excuse me, if this is more generally true, it's important, right? <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. It's important because in close, even fully vaccinated people in, in close quarters like this may transmit. However, <clears throat> this the silver lining is that you don't get very sick, right? Yeah. Can you imagine a scenario? Say 90% of the world is vaccinated. Are we still going to see scenarios like this? Or will we cut down circulation so much that we will not see these, these kinds of outbreaks? Well, we still have outbreaks of things for which a lot of people are vaccinated, <clears throat> like measles. You know, so I think there's potentially going to always be pockets. Yeah, of this influenza kind of too, yeah. But, you know, some people paint it as gloom and doom, right? Oh, we can't 
do anything, we might as well not even get vaccinated. But no, you, if you're vaccinated, it's going to keep you healthy. It'll keep you alive, right? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, Look at how much we've learned. Can, can, you know, we could, there's almost no part of this discussion we could have had a year and a half ago. No. Um, I have mixed feelings about that. <laughs> I mean, I like learning, but there's been a lot of tsuris in the past year. Yeah, this is learning the hard way. Yeah. All right. Um, one more here. Jeff writes, fun, fun. Type clinical trail into PubMed's search box. Be sure to include the double quotes and carefully note the misspelling of the word, word trail. Okay, Brian, I see you've highlighted it. Please go do it. <laughs> and in case you haven't heard by far the world's best geek joke. Okay. Did you, what do you get, Brianne, when you do that clinical? I'm, I'm pasting right now. Um, I'm getting one about the trail pathway and immunology and one about eye punctures. There are, there are a few papers I'm getting. 347 results. Trail. But it's not clear why he thinks no. this is search box. Oh, yeah, acupuncture. Yeah, I don't know what. Uh, <clears throat> well, I do see. Well, the miss, maybe they're all I the think misspellings. There's papers where, yeah, clinical <laughs> trail is misspelled in the title. That's it. That's yeah. it. That's it. <laughs> that's yeah. pretty funny. Oh, boy. All right. The world's best geek joke. <clears throat> A priest, an imam, and a rabbit walk into walk to a blood bank. The priest says, I think I'm type A. The imam says, I think I'm type B. The rabbit says, I think I'm a type O. You're in deep that, seriosity. Oh, I just got it. <laughs> it took me a while. Yes. Thanks. I don't get it. Okay. It's not rabbit, it's rap, rabbi. I think I'm a typo. <laughs> <laughs> wow, the rabbit. And I didn't yeah. even think of that in the beginning. Well, and I misread it because I thought it was a priest and a mom and a rabbi. So getting it as a typo didn't make sense to me. So, yeah, very good, Jeff. Oh, we good. have great listeners. That is yeah. good. Jeff is uh, at Stanford. All right, that's uh, that's enough of that. <laughs> Let's do some picks. <laughs> oh, I can't believe it. Brianne, what do you have for us? Um, I have something that I learned about from one of my colleagues earlier this week. Um, I was talking to him about science communication in general, and he said, oh, do you know about the work, um, he, he's a theater professor, that the Sloan Foundation does in theater? And I said, no, I, I didn't know at all. And apparently they actually have a group that, um, specifically tries to uh, have plays with um, scientific and technical themes and that feature scientists, mathematicians, and engineers as characters um, to help people understand who scientists are and what they are working on. Um, and he was talking about some of the work he'd done with that. And in fact, this foundation in general has a lot of um, support for nonprofits and support for uh, scientists. And so I'd never heard of any of this at all. Um, uh, and it was really interesting to see how um, this focus on science was being done in, in some other fields. Hmm. Excellent. Yeah, the, the Sloan uh, is into this. <clears throat> they actually give uh, grants for science communication. And I've tried, but they don't like us. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was the first I knew they existed. So, so that's cool. I thought it was interesting. Just different ways to do things. Yep. Okay, Kathy, what do you have for us? Well, as someone who doesn't usually get many side effects when I get vaccinated, <laughs> um, this appealed to me. And I think I first saw it in the ASM newsletter where they kind of curate articles and once a week send you things. And so uh, this one is a, a sort of a popular press article. And then I went and found the original um, primary research article showing that the uh, even if you don't develop side effects, the COVID vaccines are working. And so uh, let me click on the primary research article. 
they looked at healthcare workers, uh, almost a thousand of them, and um, had them self-report uh, clinically uh, clinical signs or symptoms. Um, and then regardless of symptoms, the bottom line is regardless of symptoms, the vast majority of participants, uh, greater than 99.9%, developed spike antibodies 14 or more days following the second dose. And the one that didn't, uh, so that was one out of 954, uh, was taking immunosuppressant medication. And so uh, they measure these antibodies by an ELISA. So they're simply measuring binding. They're not measuring neutralizing antibodies. They're not quantitating it or anything like that. But at least this is one peer-reviewed study. Uh, it's in uh, JAMA Internal Medicine that sort of gets at that question. Because I remember I even said that on, on a Twib once and said, you know, I don't, I don't get side effects. And Rich assured me that that was okay. I, I was still developing antibodies. <laughs> so. What was the immunosuppressant? You don't know, do you? They don't say? Mm, I don't think they said. Because mm. a lot of people want to know if they can take their prednisone when they get vaccinated, you know. And some people take daily, right? Um, <clears throat> I don't know. That's interesting. Rich, what do you have for us? I have um, a short essay that showed up in the New York Times by uh, an epidemiologist by the name of J.S. Kaufman. It's titled, Science Alone Can't Heal a Sick Society. Uh, and his theme basically here is that the uh, societal issues, I mean, it may seem obvious, but it's well-written societal issues play heavily into how the pandemic plays out. Uh, I think there's one, there's a two sentences here that, um, or one sentence, two sentences that sort of summarize it. It appears that the more salient features that distinguish pandemic severity are relational factors like economic equality and social trust. It comes as no surprise to even the casual observer that the pandemic struck most ferociously in countries ridden with political division and social conflict. And he gives some historical context uh, for this as well, where he starts off with uh, a 19th century uh, report on what was it? Uh, it was a, a typhus epidemic in Poland, where the uh, researcher sent to study it said, you know, uh, this doesn't, this is because people are living in uh, uh, bad conditions socioeconomically. As I was reading this and preparing to use this as a pick, hmm. in my mind, I started to invert it and wondered whether you can, uh, you might assess the um, uh, social and political status of a country based on the uh, COVID infection rate <laughs> or case fatality rate. Uh. <laughs> uh, in which case, uh, the United States comes out looking pretty bad. And in fact, I don't think there's any question, uh, but that uh, the pre-existing economic situation, social and economic situation, and the political situation uh, that pre-existed and was and and you know latched onto this thing has exacerbated the pandemic in this country to a very great degree. Okay, so at any rate, well, all that is background. This is a nice little piece that highlights that. I like he he writes here the political dysfunction that holds America hostage also holds science hostage. Interesting, it's true. You know we can. We can take care of some infections and some diseases, but we can't take care of the social issues, the other societal. We just can't. We can't. There's no drug. And Virtra wrote, mass disease means that society is out of joint. That's interesting. Yeah. Because we have really cool. We have, we made vaccines and we still can't 
fix things, right? Yeah, to me, that's the 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 the, the real telling thing right now is that the the surge that we're experiencing now doesn't have to happen. Certainly not to this degree. Maybe no, not no. at all because no. we have we have the we have the tools, the capability to uh, uh, immunize the population. We're just lacking the will, and in fact, there's uh, there's a sort of a counter will going on. All right. That makes it even more difficult. So there you go. Yeah, I don't, I don't understand it. I mean, when I was talking to Lex Friedman, he thinks that it's a, it's a reaction against intellectualism. He said, we have experts who think they know everything and people don't like that. So they rebel. <laughs> uh, I think it's lots of things. Of course, uh, it's never it one. Becomes yeah. in a, in, it becomes uh, it, uh, anti-vax, among other things, becomes part of a sort of a political identity or a social identity, yeah. okay? Um, and has really very little to do with science or disease until you get sick. That's just very unfortunate because people yeah. die who should not have to, who should yeah. not, right? And that yeah. is because politicians are playing yeah. with it. By the way, speaking of epidemiologists, I <clears throat> heard a talk by chair of medicine at uh, UCSF, Bob Wachter. He said uh, one of the so – someone asked him, what's changed? Or what if, what's notable to you? And he said, oh, we've learned how many epidemiologists you can fit on the head of a pin. It's <laughs> 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 funny. That's sure. good. Um, my pick is um, – a science artist, uh, Sandra Black. Um, it's actually not her real name, but it's her nom de artiste, I guess. But I've been following her on Instagram for a while, and she makes just lovely art of all kinds of things. You know, she has she takes genome sequences or plasmids and makes art. They're all very neatly done, beautifully constructed uh, antibodies, microbes. You know, the, the requisite, but protein gels, um, amino acid sequences in different colors. Really pretty. Nice I really, stuff. I really like this. And uh, I was, uh, uh, surprised when I got into it because of course I've all often thought that many of the things that we do, like e even as simple as protein gels and that kind of stuff, uh, have, intrinsic yeah, artistic value. And when I looked at this, I thought, oh, wow, she's got a picture of a protein gel. And then I looked closer <clears throat> and yeah, uh, it's a, it's a protein gel, but it's a, she's painted a watercolor. Yeah, that's of right. A protein that's gel. right. Yeah. Likewise, a, a, a DNA <laughs> gel and et cetera. So it's not the actual thing. It's a painting of the thing, but a, yeah. a, a fairly accurate, as accurate as watercolors can be, uh, representations and really nicely done. I really like this stuff. I think they're all watercolors. So she has a watercolor yeah. of hep G2 cells. She has some plasmids with open reading frames on them, which are very technical, but look very pretty. Um, these are these are really gorgeous. Um, I'm glad that this episode, you know, doesn't drop for a little bit so I can order them before all the, everyone else does. <laughs> <laughs> the ones you want. Oh, yeah. so she <laughs> says her real name is Sandra Black Culleton, right? That's how you find her on Instagram and... Um, her company is Sandra Black Art. But well, you Sandra, you need to do uh, an old time uh, Sanger sequencing gel because I want to be able to read the sequence. And it, it would also be nice to have some, uh, you know, I'd like to know what some of these plasmids are, what the, you know, insulin. Uh, uh, you know, for, if you're going to do amino acid sequences, I'd like to know what's insulin. But I guess I'm missing the point. No, there's too much, some too much of some, a nerd. There's some where it tells what it is. Yeah. I'm I'm looking at a bacteriophage watercolor right now that's fabulous. She uh, is I'm looking at one that, that looks like a 2D gel. I, I don't know if it's yes. the you were yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, really right. pretty. Yeah. She is a self taught artist and a uh, clinical lab licensed clinical laboratory scientist in microbiology. Ah. Uh. So she's seen this all in person. Yep. yep. Probably run some of the gels. Yeah. Anyway, good. I th it may have been picked years ago, but I really like these. And I yeah, see them all the time on Instagram. I've seen these before. And uh, good stuff. Check it out on Etsy. We have, a, we have a listener pick from Ruth 
Really loving your podcast and 18 months in, still engaged and gripped, even though many technical details flow by. Finding it reassuring that you guys know things and also clear about what things you and we just don't know yet. I'm sharing this great Radio Lento podcast. I have Emmy in long COVID, so can't get out and about much. I have very low activity levels. These great sound recordings of nature help me get out into the fresh air, if only virtually. Do dip in and have a listen. The most recent is sounds from a marina. Marina? Marina. 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 And wonder if Daniel Griffin might enjoy a snatch on days when he can't get out into the sea air. There are also woodland, seaside, and even roadside tracks, and some are marked as sleep safe, so you can put it on and not worry about a sudden noise. <laughs> it's funny. I shouldn't say this, but sometime I put twiv on when I can't sleep in the middle of the night, <laughs> and your banter and discussions both engage and soothe my brain, and I do nod off. Thank you so much, and so great to learn about viruses, even though one or a mix of them has scuppered my life. Hoping one day soon there will be some research to make a difference. Keep twiving, Ruth. I like that phrase, scuppered my life. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> and Ruth, you're not the first person to no. have uh, said that twiv is sometimes a nice insomnia aid. Yeah, I, I, I know particularly people who have said that they play mm -hmm. us to sleep. Yeah. Yep, me too. Well, when I go by a flagpole uh -huh. here in landlocked Austin, and I hear the hardware uh, clank against the pole. Yeah. I don't hear a flagpole. I hear a hardware on a mast in a marina. Uh, Takes yeah. me to a marina. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sound associations. It's good. All right. That's TWIV805, microbe.tv slash TWIV for the show notes. Send your questions and comments to TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you like what we do, We'd love your support. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Brian Barker's at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on the Twitter. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. It was great to be here. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. He is currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. And I'm Vincent Yellow. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIV is viral.